Get your microphone set there. All right. By the way, is uh, Toby's br Oh, yeah, that's tomorrow. I know, but you've got to get yeah. me amplified. <laughs> All right, you get your hat on there. I'm going to check your levels and make sure you're good. Bring your microphone up. You can grab that, grab the whole unit and bring it up towards you. I can do that. All right. There you go. Right there. Now, can you guys hear us out there? Yes. Yes? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me in the back. We're good? Yes. Okay, okay, good. Hear me too? Nice. Uh, no thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ron. Well, I've heard your story before, and uh, like I said, we didn't necessarily come here to talk specifically only about Bigfoot, we want to talk about the other things that have happened. And so uh, give a little background to your story and how you, uh, you know, tell people a little bit about the, the Sierra Sounds, and um, then we'll go from there about your time here in okay, Port Townsend. Well, first of all, I'd like to say I spent a lot of time in this castle because we were looking for a home here in the 90s, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of stories about this castle, the ghost stories. <laughs> And I have a personal experience here with that, which we can talk about later, I guess. But uh, bought a home down here, which is also haunted. <clears throat> this whole town is haunted. I mean, as far as uh, spooky people go. But, uh, anyway, I am uh, responsible, I guess, for the Sierra Sounds, which were recorded in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California uh, several years ago. And I've written books on it. We had the scientists we study the sounds. And uh, cryptolinguists study the sounds, and uh, scientists showed that the sounds, the, the vocalizations that we recorded in the Sierras, eight miles in the wilderness, were uh, spontaneous. They weren't manufactured. They weren't reproduced. They are real. And that's been scientifically studied by the University of Wyoming. And then uh, years later, we had a cryptolinguist uh, actually transcribe a language within these sounds. So those sounds are genuine. And that's what I do, run around and talk about those things. However, this is a ghost story, right? Well, we want to hear part of that, too. But, uh, I mean, people, is anybody not familiar with Ron's story? Raise your hand if you've never heard Ron's story, because I don't want to short sell you this. Has everybody kind of heard in the front row? Okay, so the important part, Ron, uh, that I want you to go in a little more detail about is that not only did you have activity on the Sierras, but it's ongoing activity, and it's not just allocated to the high Sierras here. So if you're not familiar with what Sasquatch is and what's going on with this phenomenon, we're talking about a group of hybridized people types that are running around not only Pacific Northwest, but running around pretty much almost on every continent, and you had a chance to document you're really the only person I know of that actually documented the longest set of vocals that, uh, you know, turned out to be language. Yeah, well, it was. It went on for more than just a season. It went on for a few years up there in the Sierras. Right. And that was uh, quite uh, interesting, really. It was an interesting part of my life, anyway. And, but I interacted with them, and uh, they were huge. They are huge. And uh, there's a mystery behind them, though. And that mystery goes into hybridization, I think. Mm -hmm. And I do believe they, they are a people, type of people. I've said that for years and years. Now, finally, I think a lot of people are acknowledging that they're more like a people than they are just an animal out in the woods. So many researchers are looking for an animal out in the woods, some kind of a, an ape or something. And, and that's not what they are. <laughs> I can tell you that. I've had first-hand experience with them. And uh, it, anyway, it's... Uh, well, well, Ron, how long did it take you to figure out that they weren't just an ape? Uh, well, I don't know that I've still figured it out, but uh, we're all still looking, because if we knew, we'd be able to sit here and tell you everything, but we, none of us really know. We're all researchers, and we're all trying to find just exactly uh, what these creatures represent. Right. They represent something very alien, very different, and uh, very elusive. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people want to just put them in a, a relic hominid group like they evolved, like humans did, but... I think they may be something different, and uh, that's because of what I've experienced up there. It's not just the interaction with them, or the, it's the mysteries that went on at the camp, uh, the lights, the, the just in 2016, <coughs> uh, my wife's going like this back there. That means I'm not talking loud now. There you, you guys go. hear me back there? Uh, Louder? Uh, All right. Uh, and then say a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, in 2016, her and I were up there, and... Uh, a strange thing happening, and usually nothing happens when a strange person goes up, and that was her first trip up there. And uh, 
But this elongated light, which I just talked about in David Pilates, the missing 411, the hunters, he, he uh, filmed me up there last year. In a, and you've in never taken anybody up to that camp before, so to He's bring him first. was a big deal. He was the first, yeah. I, I finally allowed someone to go up there and document the camp, and mm -hmm. I'm glad I did because it went on, it caught fire here just, just a short time after that. Right. Uh, but anyway, we, um, we, and he did a re really good reproduction of this in the in the 411 movie that he just came out with. But it's an elongated light comes floating by our tent. Now, right. we're eight miles in the wilderness. I mean, you, it takes a lot to get there. It's a very imposing trip, a very, very remote area. And this elongated light comes floating by our tent about 40 feet by it. And we watch that thing for several seconds. It must have been close to a minute, really. And, uh, what do you do with something like that? I mean, it's really strange. Right. And uh, other strange things that happen up there too, but that uh, that was uh, unusual. I've never seen anything like that. We've seen other types of light, but uh, different things follow us around and stuff like that. But it all seems to be associated with the Bigfoot phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So for years now, I've been talking about the Bigfoot mystery. Just this last week, I spoke to two MUFON groups down in Southern California, and I'm I'm associating that now. Now, since the uh, Navy has acknowledged that uh, that there are UFOs, everybody know that. Yeah. yeah. Well, somebody's flying those things. <clears throat> I kind of think it's an alien. And so, if aliens exist, and they do, you got to have your head in the sand to think that we're the only people in the universe, right? Well, uh, what are they doing? Why do they want this Earth? Why are they here trying to hybridize hybridization? I think there's a hybridization program going on. There's a lot of documentation of different things like that going. And uh, alien abductions and stuff like that is, uh, well, strange stuff. And we're all strange people, right? <laughs> Some more than others. <laughs> I'm looking out of here at old Titsy <laughs> McGee with the hat on. Good Lord. <laughs> if, you need, if you need some whole milk, you but. can just lean over the counter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to thank Toby for inviting me here. This is great, Toby. I live over here in Squim. Yeah, I do, and and it's just a great. By the way, happy birthday! Did I say that? I it's know. His birthday tomorrow. 27. By the way, twenty-seven. It's so rough. So I know. Y'all got to come back tomorrow and join the party. Oh my We're going to be here, and right. uh, everybody gets to wear a costume and have fun with Toby. I mean, it's going to be <laughs> raw on my hiney. I know. Um, okay, so you started to see. Because I know a little bit of your story here, so I'll just cheat a little bit and uh, fill people in. You, in the sounds, not only in your book, but you explain also of these anomalous things that happen as far as, like, it sounded like the whole camp, your, your elk camp high up in the Sierras, was getting torn down. And that may necessar not necessarily have anything to do with Bigfoot as far as people are concerned, but when you get invested in this phenomena here, this paranormal stuff starts to pepper its its way along with the phenomena. I call it like a potpourri paranormal thing. And so this mimicry quality to them, is it just mimicry or are they, are they eliciting something else? I think they have uh, superior vocal abilities, more so than we do. We have two vocal cords. They, I think they have more than that. that that's what accounts for the uh, very unusual sounds that we uh, had up there. It's been shown by the University of Wyoming that their sound vibrate, their frequency goes way above what we can do as humans, goes way below what we can do as humans, which suggests infrasound and ultrasound. It also is within our range also, which, which gives them a mimic ability. But they have a language. We've, disturb, we've de de determined that by the cryptolinguist study. He was uh, 30 years retired as a cryptolinguist from the Navy. He got a hold of this by accident, and uh, he started studying these things, and he transcribed a language within these sounds that we've recorded. We recorded them mainly from 1971 through 1976, and those sounds have been established pretty much. And, but other things have happened up there since then, but I don't even try to record anymore because you don't know what they're saying. It's just transcribed uh, as a language by the human definition of language, which means, that's very important that we understand this, language is a sapient sentence which comes out of my mouth like like what I'm doing now I hope where I'm <laughs> talking to you guys in a, in a sapient way uh, it's not like just communicating like all animals communicate but these things communicate with a language by the human definition language like we have which creates which means you have to have a hyoid bone here which floats and it's connected to the brain through the nerves and, and the tongue and you can 
You can uh, talk like we're talking. Other animals don't have that. I don't care if you're a dolphin or if you're a whale or whatever you are. Uh, you can't talk like we're talking right now. And these things can do that, and more so. And I think maybe they, they have a, a way of changing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, let's get into Tesla stuff. I like the quantum physics aspect okay. of this. That's where my last book goes. And you get into that, and uh, you get into everything's a fi uh, vibration, frequency, or energy. And uh, if you think about that a little bit, if these things have the range that I suggest they have, and what I've heard and what's uh, been shown, uh, what, what can that mean? It means that they can maybe maybe manipulate matter, because if you get the frequency right, you can manipulate matter. And I think that's how the ancients did in the ancient texts. This guy 2,000 years ago used to do miracles, but he used the laws of quantum physics, and he said, we can do the same thing, which means humans have not been, have not been shortchanged with all this attributes. We just haven't learned how to access them yet. So that's where I go with my thoughts, anyway. And as far as that sound goes that you were talking about, our camp being tore apart, well, yeah, you thought you thought you heard the barrels being messed with, which we packed in with mules. You heard all these things being scattered around out there, and uh, you look out there later out of our shelter, and nothing's changed. So I don't know how to explain that other than they either hypnotized us all. There were six of us, five at that time, and uh, either they hypnotized us all, thought we were we were hearing that, or they was really creating that sound with their vocal mechanism. Would you agree, Ron, that, uh, I mean, once you start to experience this stuff, it kind of marks you to experience other things in life as well that are paranormal? <laughs> well, I don't know, but it, it did. It has. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if it's, it's, uh, if it's, some people are just open to that or, or if you're marked. But, uh, yeah, we had a clicking sound up there, which uh, we heard inside when we were inside the shelter. There was three of us up there that night, and this clicking sound moved closer and closer and closer to the shelter, had the door closed on the shelter, which was just a big log fit between these two trees and cabled. And uh, all of a sudden, that clicking sound was inside. Right. So you turn the light on, you don't see anything. You can't see the source of it. But then <laughs> two weeks later, I'm down in the valley, uh, irrigating at my property and uh, I hear this clicking sound following me around out there. I stop and think, well, what's, I got something in my boot or what is it going on? It's the same clicking sound I had up the camp. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, that's weird. But something, and also other things have happened out in my house too, which I've heard other people say. But anyway, I asked Bill McDowell, he was my buddy up there that night when the clicking sound was going on. I asked him without telling him about the clicking sound, have you ever had anything happen uh, when you're back down here. He said, yeah, you remember that clicking sound we had? He said, I had that happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you explain? It's something, I'm going to say this word. You ready? Paranormal. It's just something we don't understand, but I think there's a, there's a law behind it. There's, there's, a, there's a science behind everything. And Al Berry, who, bless his heart, he's passed away now, but he, he was a master's in science, and he was the investigative reporter that we took into the camp to investigate what was going on. And he wrote a book in 1976, I think it was, and uh, talked about our camp, and that was the first book he co-authored with Ann Slate. And anyway, uh, he said, whatever you do, don't talk about the screwy stuff that goes on up here. He says, he says don't or you won't get invited to go to any of these places and talk. And uh, he says, stay with science. Well, he, he was saying, stay with classical science, because you've got to explain everything. And we think everything's in our in our little world here that we see. Well, according to quantum physics, the math of quantum physics, there's 11 dimensions, and we live in three. So we're three-dimensional embodiments, but if you get out of that, you don't see. You, you, your perception isn't there, because mm -hmm. the light frequency is right here, and yet all these other frequencies are out there. Mm -hmm. And if you can catch those frequencies, and that's where ghosts come in, I think. Because okay. I think they're caught between the fourth and fifth dimension. So what fifth dimension you won't see, by the way. What makes Sasquatch any different than a ghost? Because the similarities, uh, sometimes just with my own personal stuff, it seems like one and the same as far as well, how I these Well, I think ghosts, are, ghosts uh, have had an embodiment here like we do now, and they've passed on because energy can't die, according to Stephen Hawkins. And so if energy can't die, it just changes form. And according to Einstein, the same thing. It just mm -hmm. changes form. Energy can't die. 
So that means you know, if you're religious, you might call that heaven, but uh, physicists will call that a dimension. And if there's 11 dimensions and we live in three, uh, what's going on that we don't see? We only see in this light frequency of this certain parameters here. Once you get out of that, you, you're not seeing it. You, you don't have the perception of it. But other things exist. And uh, you have to realize that other things are out there. And ghosts are one of them. And I think they're caught between the fourth and fifth dimension. Something's holding them there, either themselves or some other person. Right. That's my theory. Theory. Oh. Theory. theory, theory, and uh, let's let's talk about your theory here on Port Townsend because, you know, being new in town, I've only been here for five or six months myself. Um, we've had a few trips to Port Townsend, and mostly people say that it's a pretty active town. That's why we kind of chose this environment to do a show about this stuff. But uh, you've lived here before. In fact, you know, you had a house here, so. Um, Tell us a little bit about what it's like to live here and what you had happen. Well, we were trying to transfer ourselves from California mm -hmm, into Washington. <laughs> no taxes up here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were looking for a home. We stayed here at the castle quite a bit. Loved the restaurant here. Walter was a cook then and just a great fun place. We knew the waitress and the chef and all that stuff. So we were looking around. We finally bought this house about 100 yards down here. It's called the Holly Manor. And okay. uh, it's a four-story house, actually, a big basement, and then three stories above it. And I spent a fortune, went through a divorce on that. Other than that, everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, while we were staying here at the castle, before we bought that house, uh, it was winter time, and uh, we rented a room up here, and there was a lot of commotion going on from a room next door or somewhere, either above us or beside us. and. Well, the next morning, I asked the uh, clerk, uh, how many people we had staying over there? Last he said, you're the only one that stayed in that wing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, there's a ghost in here. And I thought, well, he really? <laughs> 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 then I heard the story uh, about the woman jumping out of the room uh, up there. But found out the house we bought after we bought it, Holly Manor down here, in 1936, a colonel from the First World War killed himself in it. And uh, some strange things happened in that house. Well, before we go, I want to hear more about this. Oh, yeah. Maybe people don't know about this woman that committed suicide. Let's go back to that for a second. What happened? Well, what she you know? was the daughter of the one who owned the place. Okay. The that owned the place, my understanding. And uh, she was in love, and her the colonel down there were, were in love, and they were going to get married. But he found out he had diabetes. And in those days, diabetes would, was a death sentence. So I guess he killed himself in that house. I uh, didn't know that till after we bought it either. But uh, anyway, uh, she ended up killing herself. So what, what how, how do, the story do you know how she there. died? Or she jumped out the window up there. This side? Out the, I don't really know what side. I don't know if I'm staying in the right room or not, so <laughs> I, I should probably check that out. Yeah. Are I, we staying in the death know, room? I, okay. All right. But we could probably see where she hit from where we're sitting. Oh, right. Well, you see that big bloody spot out there? <laughs> right. That's where the rose bushes is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark humor. Come on. All right. All right. So a poor lady committed suicide. You experienced, was that the room right next to you? Or were you yes, in her room? Yes, it was. Okay. Uh, we were told. Yeah. All right. And, uh, no one else was in the, in the place that night. So that was interesting. Okay. And you would think maybe water pipes juggling or something like that, but no, it was somebody pounding. I thought they were having a, just a good time, but. Uh, <laughs> Scrabble, folks. Scrabble. They're the hard game of Scrabble. Anyway, yeah. uh, uh, that's that story. And uh, then I've heard numerous stories from when I was talking to the people that worked here about seeing ghosts and seeing things here. So this is a strange castle. I had the Jesuits priest here years ago, you know. This used to be a uh, mm -hmm. place for them. And it was, uh, let's see, the house I had bought was a hospice in the, in the war. And uh, anyway. And uh, this house is still there, right? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Trust me, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> it must still, you house. think it's still haunted? I, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But I know the, the guy, or I suppose it was a guy, I don't know who the ghost was, but mm -hmm. it was a friendly ghost, nothing wrong. And it didn't scare us. 
But uh, one time I was upstairs, and no one was downstairs. I right. was all upstairs, and all the bedrooms were on the second floor, third floor, depending on how you count the basement. But um, anyway, uh, I heard this big commotion go down there, and I went down there, and my wife's purse, which was on the bench down there, had been moved clear across, had been thrown clear across the room, and no one was down there. So that was kind of weird. But then weirdness is... Just understanding. <laughs> it's part of your <laughs> regular life. What about your current home with you and Carrie? Do you guys have anything happen at your house you live at now? Because one of the theories is this stuff follows you around, right? Uh, uh, she's got a maybe hiding back there. She may not want to talk about this. But okay. Yeah, we had we've had a few things happen there, and a woman died there. We didn't know. You know, these people die in these houses, and if they can't transfer, if their vibration frequency doesn't get high enough, you're never going to get out. Right. And you got to get out if you want to go to the next dimension, next, next, uh, whatever it is, the next. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's next. I mean, Einstein wouldn't guess. And that's spooky action at a distance. Too, you know? Spooky action at a distance, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah. So you've uh, had stuff happen there. We've had stuff happen there. Like uh, what? Well, a mirror jumped off the wall, broke a, a, a big, something went through our glass one time and uh, broke one of the windows. And, Wait, uh, like a hanging mirror in the hallway? In, in one of the bedrooms. And it f- came off the nail? Yeah. Okay. All right. And the nail was still on the wall. Carrie, was the nail still on the wall? Where are you? It was. Yeah. So it was a haunted mirror. Well, there's a thing about mirrors too, right? Like. Oh, there's a Oh, there's a red. That's right. You were. Well, working, yeah. <laughs> she's a therapist. Poor she redheads. Work, they always. She's a therapist. Yeah. She was working on someone that had red hair. Uh-huh. And, uh, anybody here with red hair? Uh-huh. <laughs> Six fingers, double row teeth, anything like that? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> We're going to talk about that, too. Well, let's talk about it now. Six. What he's alluding to are these elongated skulls, and we were going to bring an elongated skull here that Ron has as a, you know, it's a mock-up of, of a child's elongated skull, but um, since we have a limited amount of time to go over some of this stuff here, um, I do want to talk to you about these elongated skulls, so let's talk a little bit about it. Because, Ron, you're an adventurer. Uh, you know, you've had the chance to travel to where? Tibet, South America, Russia? You Russia. Been, Russia, yeah. Mexico. I mean, all over the world, and you're chasing down these legends. You know, you're, you're after the information. And one of the places you had to go was with uh, Brian Forrester and Ellie Marzuli down to South America and Peru and check out this mystery of these elongated skulls. So people are kind of under the impression that most of these skulls are cradle-boarded skulls done by humans to mimic whatever they are mimicking. And that is true, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about something altogether different. So explain to people uh, what exactly you saw. Okay, there's a lot of them down there. They're all over. You've got the Wakaros, which are grave robbers, and they are digging up uh, graves, and they find, uh, they're looking for jewelry or something like that from these uh, people that were buried. And it, it, it's massive, the graveyards down there. It's just, it's the cradle board of the world, I think, because there's so many. And all you see, you look out over the seven uh, miles of stuff, you see these mounds dip, mounds dip all over. Like somebody's out there with a backhoe or something, but what's what Carol's digging up these graves looking for something special. And when they find an elongated skull, they would take it to a museum and try to sell it privately, and they would buy it. So we was down in Paracas about four four hours south of Lima and uh, seen these elongated skulls, and we did a study on them. Uh, I went with L.A. Missoula. My, my interest was the elongation because a lot of sagittal crests are, that's the elongated are reported on Bigfoots. Right. So I wanted to see if there's anything correlating there. And uh, anyway, when we was down there, I was two, di- 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 ter- two different times with two different scientists on two different expeditions. And uh, we weighed the skulls, we checked them. They are not human, not totally. They're hybrid type beings, which were, uh, when I say that, they have a, uh, we have two parietals, one on each side of our skull with a sagittal suture in between. You guys still hear me? And uh, these things don't have that. It's just one single parietal. And the Incas uh, mimic them for the royalty, the child royalty, trying to get the same attributes they think, we think, that 
that these pre-Inca people had, which was... Keep talking. I'm going to play a video while you're talking. You haven't been recording this? I didn't have to have my hat on. <laughs> yeah, I should have brought one over because I had them... Uh, we did get uh, permission down there to unwrap one that was mummified. And uh, it was elongated baby skull. And uh, it, it was also no sigil suture, not cradle board. They called it cradle deformation. And those things are uh, all over down there. But the royalty, they bury it in another spot and they don't let you go there anymore. They try to keep the Waqueros out, the grave robbers, uh, just because of what they're doing. That's Marcia Moore. She, uh, Marcia Moore. Yeah, she's uh, she's doing quite remarkable work on those things. Um, I took, I went down there with them, and uh, we we were unwrapping these skulls, and uh, actually went into some tombs also, and uh, pulled out some bones. We put them back though, uh, but we got permission to uh, to uh, study them, weigh them, and all that. And they're thirty about thirty percent larger, more brain mass than we have. And yet, when the cradle board, when the Incas cradle boarded theirs, they didn't get more brain matter. They just got elongated skulls, <laughs> which we would get if we did it. They only did that with their youth, the royalty youth, I should say. And uh, anyway, uh, they also had two little pinholes in the back of their head, which we don't have any idea what that was all about. But, uh, yeah, these holes are really super weird. I mean, it almost looks like little nasal passages in the back of your skull. Um, mm -hmm. They're super tiny, but they're not indicative of anything human. Right. Don't know what that was about. But uh, they are, we think, responsible for the megalithic structures, which you see in, uh, all over down there in Cusco. And we don't, don't let that pan do. That's where you get on the train to go to Machu Picchu, Picchu, whatever it is. <laughs> and <laughs> just 100, 100 tons of rocks have uh, been moved up from miles away, quarried from miles away, and put up on these big mountains, and put so uniquely together, uh, like a jigsaw puzzle, no mortar. Right. Uh, and uh, it, how do you do that? I mean, we, we couldn't do that today, I don't think. And uh, not, uh, just how they moved them, how they did all that is, is quite the mystery still. Well, so I think they did it with sound vibration. Sound right vibration, there. and yeah. what about tools? Do you think they had ancient tech? They didn't, we, we checked, the, Inca, the Incas didn't for sure because the Incas want to take responsibility for that, but the Incas didn't do it. They didn't have the tools, and we, we know that. Brian Forster's researched that thoroughly. He's written books, uh, Inca Tours, I think he's called. Right. But uh, anyway, he's, uh, he's, he's the guy to go to down there. He knows more about that area than the locals do. Yeah, one of his theories is that uh, the Incas discovered these megalithic machined structures from these folks here. And um, then they came along and they basically adapted over the top of these structures. So it'd be the equivalent of someone finding, you know, a, a Hilton Garden suite, you know, and, uh, and building on top of it their rough little attempt at, you know, doing some kind of crude form of architecture over this masterpiece. So um, that was his theory. I think it's probably the right theory. You know, if you look at where the megalithic stones are without mortar and then what's built on top of them, it, you know, very oh, difficult. Oh, it's amazing. If you ever get a chance to go down and see that, uh, it's, it's just what they've done is just phenomenal. You can't imagine how or why. Right. Uh, unless it's, who knows why. I mean, I don't know why. So there's tests that are done on these skulls recently as far as where the male mm -hmm. side of these genes Yeah, the mitochondrial DNA, which is the uh, maternal side of these things, supposedly came out of a Turkey, Siberia area, and uh, not Siberia, but Turkey, uh, Syria area. And uh, it showed that it was uh, from there, but now you got a culture over here on the other side, another clear across the water, the Atlantic, with the same... I mean, that's where they came from. The Black Sea, is that right? Well, the Atlantic. Yeah. Uh, they went clear to South America from over there. So either they it happened when the continents were together or where they had a way of transporting or they had the same technology. Uh, I don't know. But it, the maternal DNA was uh, shown from there. Mm. Uh, but you also got the DNA from more recent, you know, some Bigfoot stuff. 
Which well, that is there any similarities between the discoveries of those skulls and what happened with the, you know, the Sasquatch DNA debacle? Yeah. If you can find the nuclear DNA, which is the male counterpart, uh, that would solve a lot. And so far, it hasn't been determined what that is because it's mm -hmm. it's unidentified, and uh, that uh, that's out of 224 billion samples in the gene bank. Right. They can't match it. So if that's the case, and that is the case, uh, that's why classical science has given these DNA things a thumbs down because it doesn't fit into the parameters of classical science. Uh, anyway, it's, it's uh, quite interesting to look at, but you've also got the newest, newer one with Melba Ketchum, you know, did that first one, and she got her written up bad. She just dropped out of the whole scene because she said it was not contaminated. But as soon as they find out there's a human side to this thing on they the maternal are, part, right. They say it's contaminated, and uh, therefore it's, it's got to be a hoax or wrong, mm -hmm. contaminated, whatever. So she just dropped out of the scene, but then you got the one um, the expedition that National Geographic sponsored up in Bhutan, 17,000 feet in the Himalayas. That was done in 2014, and two years later, the geneticists came back and said that the maternal side was 99% human of this Yeti track, they think it was, of... Uh, Five to uh, 17,000 feet, they see these barefoot tracks, and they took the eDNA, which is environmental DNA, they took it out and found that it was human, 99% human. And still, they can't determine the nuclear part, you know, right. the, the uh, male counterpart, which falls into alien intervention into the human genome or into any genome. In the genome of a primate, that's why you don't discount anything these people tell you, whether it's a wolf man or whatever, because you don't know what's out there that you're not seeing. You just only see within your parameters, within your light perception, and that puts us in our three-dimensional environment that we live in. One thing, I, just going back real quick to the skull here, you told me, and this blew my mind, is that there is elongated skulls found in utero yeah. mummified. Yeah. So that should be that's a game changer, right? Because that's not cradle boarding in utero. So talk more about that. That's it. You just said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nah, nah, all right. No, but I mean, that's really... Well, you're finding the womb of a woman, you know, they right. hadn't cradle boarded it. I mean, that'd pick quite a feat, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, so they're naturally elongated, and that's important to know because so many people say, well, the Incas did that, they cradle boarded, you know, yeah. like the Egyptians did. Well, yeah, they did, but that's not what those skulls represent. So what's the big holdup? I asked Marcia this question here, too. We're not talking about a cryptid. We're talking about something, let's just use the United States. They could own this story and tell it themselves. I mean, they could own the byline of, of how to tell this part of history. We have the skulls. It's not a cryptid. We, we have the scientific evidence. Why the mystery? What, what? Good question. Uh, why? Everybody here believes that everything the government tells you is the truth, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, everything's true. And there wasn't aliens here either till just recently. Uh, you know, I th I think they keep it concealed because they keep you dumbed down. They don't want you to know what's really going on. And anybody's experienced the weirdness around some of this stuff will mm -hmm. will understand what I'm saying right now. And that's that uh, there's things going on we just don't know about, and that's because the government. Conceals it. I mean, all the the giant artifacts that's been taken away from the level of skulls, which I've been to four times. Those skulls, you can't see them anymore. You can't see the giant double row of teeth. I got a picture of one <laughs> that was taken 40 years ago before they took it away. And they take those things away and they hide them. And uh, they don't want you to know. And any university that wants to study it or any mm -hmm. s classical scientist who wants to get out of his box, a classical box, uh, is going to lose his tenure, lose his reputation with academia. Uh, just, uh, it's it's hard to break that that silence that's been kept from us. Now, in the Lovelock Cave case, they actually chipped away. They they removed the handprints too, didn't they? I mean, they were visible at one time, and somebody came in and chipped <laughs> the handprints off. Is that the story? I was there. <laughs> I mean, I seen the handprints. Went back a couple weeks later with L.A. Missoula because he wanted to see them. They'd been cleaved off. I don't know if they were chipped off, washed off, or how they got off. But I don't know if it's a handprint. It might just be an inference, which means it looked like a handprint. It was right. huge. 
And of course, the Lovelock Caves, if you're not familiar with what that is, the Paiutes uh, were warring with the uh, hairy, red-headed, giants. red-headed, cannibalistic giants. And they rounded all the Paiutes got together and round and went together and drowned these guys into this cave, Lovelock Cave. Put a fire there, smoked them out, and as they came out, they they killed them, supposedly. And uh, that's the Paiute story, and it's in the Winter, Sarah Winnemucca's book, and she writes about it. And uh, now you'd ask the BLM, which I wrote to them, and they said there's no giants ever been found there, just big people. Well, uh, eight foot tall is a big person. <laughs> that's you a know. big person, yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, BLM hiding it. They they got to their government agency I yeah. guess, in a way. So this this stuff gets hidden from us, and we just have to uh, understand that because we're not being told everything that exists. And there's a lot existing. I think the government knows about Bigfoot. I'm quite sure of it. I just wrote a forward for a man uh, named uh, uh, Shane Land. He's going to come out with it before the year's out. And uh, he's he's a physicist, or excuse me, it's a PhD, and he's written a book. He took off of my book, which is Quantum Physics, Quantum Bigfoot. Right. And his is called uh, Bigfoot something else. And uh, anyway, it's uh, it's very compelling because he gets into the government. He was a he was in intelligence in the military, mm-hmm. and he knows how all this stuff's working. And he really gets into it good. And and I'm uh, I'm appreciating the the honor of writing the forward to that. Have you ever been contacted by a government official, Ron, in private? Uh, not that I know of. No one's ever introduced <laughs> themselves to you? And I no, no men in black has got me yet, so I guess I'm not close enough to the, whatever's going on. <laughs> uh, but you had government interested in your sounds. I mean, uh, Scott may have been retired, but surely Scott has connections to people that are still connected in the military, so that's never reached back to you? No, no, it hasn't. Scott Nelson's a cryptolinguist that, right. that transcribed the, the language and, yeah, and these sounds. Right. And he doesn't know what they're saying. I wish I knew what they were saying because that one night I was interacting mm-hmm. with it, I was able to record it. Uh, they were definitely trying to ask me something. I have no idea what it was, but uh, I wish I knew. Has anybody, people, anybody not heard these sounds before? Does anybody not familiar with what Ron's talking about? Yeah, if you're not... the you have your CDs back there. I do, yeah. Yeah, and if you want to hear them, you can probably find them on your phone somewhere. But uh, just in short, explain what we're talking about vocally. They sound like what? What do they sound like? Yeah. I mean, does it sound like... It sounds not like monkeys as much as it sounds like kind of euro It's a gibberish. It's yeah. similar to uh, what Albert Osman uh spoke of, he was the guy who got kidnapped supposedly by a Bigfoot in 1924. John Green, he's deceased now, but John Green interviewed him in the 50s and he said he was in Tobey in Canada. He got carried away in a sleeping bag and was uh, held captive by a, a Bigfoot creature and a woman, a Bigfoot, and two adolescents, there was four of them there. And he said they were gibbering amongst themselves. And uh, if you ever want to read that, it's in The Apes Among Us by John Green. Right, and I would explore that one time with uh, Peter Byrne and Al Berry. We flew up there in my plane, and we uh, researched that whole area, trying to trying to find the bowl that he said he was kept in. We had a helicopter on standby over in Camel River, and we was going to drop in over there and look for the artifacts. Because so, he, he escaped by giving them one of them his uh, chewing tobacco. <laughs> right, because they seen him putting the chaw in his mouth, and they thought this must be good. So they gave him he gave him a a dose of it, and a guy got sick that was guarding him, and he took off, and he describes everything to a T, how he got out of there, he said where he seen Mount Baker, and what he was crossing here, and where he came out, and all that stuff, and, and he uh, he was quite compelling, quite interesting to, uh, I mean, it was, right. there, of course, everybody believes the story, because it was, uh, he was too detailed to, mm-hmm. to have just made it up, but, uh, so anyway, uh, the gibberish is, uh, just that, it's gibberish. You don't know what they're saying. They talk very rapidly. They move very fast. Uh, when you see one, they're just like a streak uh, mm-hmm. going through. And I've only seen one once. Uh, that was at our camp, and that's when I was recording. So people say, well, if you don't see what you heard, you don't know what made that sound. Well, that was true with Al Berry, because he never got to see what was making the sound, but he certainly got some recordings that were good. Right. And uh, we were all getting good recordings. But uh, anyway, he uh, 
Uh, this one I seen made that big, what they call the samurai cry, uh, big, big scream. And that's when I seen him running down to the other two, uh, adolescent and a female down here by the creek. And uh, me and Bill McDowell were there, my friend. We were mm -hmm. the packers. We packed horses and supplies in with our horses and mules and getting ready for hunting season. We were hunting then. I don't hunt anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you this question here, and I, I don't know if you're going to tell this story, but I'll ask you to tell it. Um, let's close the this interview up with the story. You're up in the High Sierra camps with Scott. You're packing in. You can't get into the camp there. I'll just kind of give the bullet points. You br end up breaking some ribs because your horse rolls. You have to go back to the base camp. Your ride hasn't come yet. The, the whole effort is scrubbed. So there you guys are at the base of the Sierra Mountains waiting, I believe, for your daughter to come back. And as you're waiting there, you're convalescing. The horses are all tied up. Take it from there because there's some real weirdness that happened there. It's a weird story. Yeah. It's a long story, so I can't make it what it is. But, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was on a horse that I thought was supposedly uh, trail ready. I gave Scott Nelson the good horse that I usually ride. and So he didn't get thrown. I did. <laughs> but the trail was very imposing to get up there. It was very tough. And uh, uh, it takes a good mountain horse to make that trip. But anyway, I got thrown uh, he nursed me back down. I, I had a broken rib or two and uh, went around to where my daughter was camped out and uh, about 12 miles away around this mountain area. But yeah, uh, that morning she saw a Bigfoot run across the little area there. She jogged, my, uh, jogged me a little bit and said, I just saw some out, one out there. My granddaughter was with her, Wendy, and uh, I got pictures, <coughs> pictures of some of this stuff because it's kind of a really compelling story but, right um, anyway she thought sure enough Wendy would see the thing because Wendy they'd been bothered all night that night in their tent Scott knows it so the tent and um, the thing was running towards where Wendy should have been where Wendy was we asked Wendy her my daughter did did you see anything when you were over there and she said yes there's a big white wolf come right out in front of me ran out in front of me and just stood there and looked at me and then ran up the mountain and uh, that's as far as I can go with that because <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> but if they can manipulate energy like I think they can, uh, yeah. like I think anybody can if you just learn the frequencies, uh, if you can manipulate that, you can change. And that's where the Skinwalker Wet and Ranch comes in. So don't discount the weirdness that you hear because just you don't have to believe it, but just don't discount it. Just keep it in your head. It'll all come together maybe sometime. But uh, anyway, we found the trackway of this thing. And it was, the, these things were leaving tracks really, this thing was leaving really deep tracks, and they just stopped. And I've heard for years, I've interviewed people for years, and they say that they see these things disappear. Mm -hmm. Well, how can something just disappear? It doesn't disappear. It goes out of our perception. We only see here. Everything's out here. And uh, so that, that kind of brought it personal to me because I seen a trackway disappear. I looked up in the trees, could have jumped up there, could have went to a boulder over there, could have jumped over into brush over there. It didn't go anywhere. The tracks just stopped. And uh, anyway, you get into quantum physics and you find out that our density weighs and it's got mass and we will make a print, but energy won't do that. So somehow I think with their vocal mechanism, which is very, very unique, uh, they are able to transfer matter to energy and that's bottom line what i got to say <laughs> and that's physics okay tell them what happened to your horse though oh the horse yeah oh, God, the horse i mean this part <clears throat> we had them all tethered uh, uh, separately but same area and uh, yeah the horse <laughs> was on her back all four sticking straight up and you think i thought she's dead because you don't see a horse like that ever I've never seen one like that anyway. And uh, anyway, she was just laying there with ball fours up on, up sticking straight up. What a photograph that would have been. But I didn't feel like taking a picture. I didn't think <laughs> about it. Because uh, there's so much going on that night. A lot of went on that night. And uh, But all that day, we were we were all day trying to get up to the trail. And something kept, right. kept messing with us. And finally, the cap on it all was when the horse threw me and I broke my ribs. 
and that means we it was five o'clock in the afternoon and we weren't even halfway there so well at the scott told me too that you guys brought like jane goodall style rubber balls oh and he, that night yeah. he was woken up to the sound of rubber balls bouncing around the forest yeah he needs yeah. to tell that story because i didn't hear that yeah uh, and then he wakes up sees this horse you know, uh -huh. legs sticking straight up like rigor mortis style between a tree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah thought, it's like in a trance or something. Uh-huh. I don't know how, yeah, really. She yeah. wasn't dead. No. No. Was that the horse that threw you? Huh? Or was that a different horse? No, that was the horse he was riding. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I never saw that. Yeah. Your good horse. <laughs> the good one. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's never been the same since. All right. Well, Ron, I appreciate you coming today. Um... This has uh, been exactly the way I planned it with you, and uh, thanks for talking to everybody here. If you have some questions for Ron, he's going to be back at his table, and uh, hopefully you can stick around for a while. But thanks, buddy, for talking to us all. Well, thank you, Toby. All right, Ron Moorhead. Yeah. <laughs> Watch your step there, buddy. By the way, if you see me wobbling, it's uh, I haven't had too much drink. I just uh, I had brain surgery two years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> Left my balance nerve a little off, so be careful when I'm getting yeah, close no, to you. Yeah, no pushing Ron around here. Uh, no pushing me. Yeah. yeah <laughs> All right. There we go. Okay, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go right into our next guest here. Sarah, are you in the house? She's talking over there. I'll leave it to a. Leave it to a psychic to be talking to somebody. My goodness. All right. So uh, while Sarah Nash is getting herself ready here, Sarah Nash is a local to town here. Uh, we just met each other a couple months ago. She's also been a, uh, a representative of uh, the LAPD and uh, as a psychic medium. So she has some really history, interesting history with working with uh, law enforcement in a capacity that's highly unusual. She's also worked here at the castle. So you can imagine she has a few stories to talk about and we're going to talk about that. Local legend psychic medium, Sarah Nash, come on board. Yes. There's Sarah, and this is her. I was supposed to get a heads up on this so I could lift it on. Oh dear, no, you're good, you're good. All right. Leah. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's kind of like she needs attention and love. <laughs> Come on. Let's check out your mic here and see how All you right. sound. All right. Go ahead and bring it up if you need to because. Oh, sola mio. <laughs> ah, mio my. I love it. It's like an Enigma video Sorry. here with your hood on. <laughs> All right. Let me see how that sounds. Just a little bit closer. There you go. You Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. There you okay. go. How's this? That's perfect. All right, because I'm not going to sit on this chair like this all. Okay, time. you can move it however you like. And what? Make sure you don't fall off the back there. Because I won't fall off. I you're won't. right I by won't. the. Okay, you're good. Simmer <laughs> down. So much. I, well, <laughs> and she's close, is she not? Yeah. Okay. She's. Can really everyone close. hear me? Yes. Yes, that's good. All right, Sarah, welcome to Strange Brow Radio. This is our second interview together. But we Look at all these happy people. The food here is really good, isn't it? It is exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. This Very is much really so. good. <laughs> all right. Uh, so tell people a little bit about yourself and not only the work that you've done, uh, you know, locally here, but you work for law enforcement and you also were here at the castle as an employee. So tell people what you do and your intuitive abilities, and uh, then we'll get to uh, this beauty right here. Sure, I just, uh, I wasn't sure where you wanted me to start. Yeah, well, uh, let's, let's to give people a little bit of a backstory of who you are. Okay, well, um, I am technically deaf, all right? I This ear here is just decoration, and, uh, is it, are You're we good? good. Are yeah. we good? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I really believe, I'm, I'm a little bit with Ron on this. Well, actually, I'm a lot with Ron on this. Uh, I'm more of a mentalist before I'm a psychic. I am a scientist before anything else. Uh, when I worked for federal government, and I'm not supposed to say what it is, but you know, you can come up with the, the three letters. Okay. <laughs> and the LAPD. They don't call us psychics. They call us consultants. So when they, they reach a dead end, 
um, they will they will reach out, and because they they come to a pl uh, place in a in a case. Hello. That's better. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So they, they, they reach a point in a case, and it happened, when I say they, I mean investigators. And these are private investigators, these are detectives, and these are law enforcement officials who get to a place where, I mean, this is a science. So they call people like me. And my specialist, my specialty is as a rescue medium. I tend to have a lot of success with finding those who have died violent deaths uh, by either accident or as a homicide or as a suicide. So I go in and I've had some really excellent, excellent and beautiful opportunities to speak to the, the departed. And uh, one of the funny stories I have is when my father passed away, I was with him. I was with him for three days as he was getting ready to pass over to the other side. And when I got home, I was really upset. And uh, I was talking to my husband. And my husband reminded me, he said, yeah, honey, you can, you can talk to the dead. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. So uh, <laughs> I, you know, I rang my dad up on the, uh, the hotline, and, and he was there. And it was one of those moments, too, where you have these these times where it's 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 like it applies to everybody else but not yourself it's like i can do what i do for other people but not myself and that's why i'm really really fortunate to have the friends that i do in my life and that's one of the things that i think is is incredibly important for people like me to be surrounded by people who uh, will support you and and so in this business and i know we're filled we have this room here with people who are not necessarily woo-woo, but we are researchers. We are investigating things that, no. <laughs> it looks great. So, Tobe, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the work that you're doing um, with Strange Brow Radio, and thank you for having me here. Yeah. And thank you for he being here at Manresa, because I truly believe that there is, and it's not just that I believe, I know that there is an interdimensional, it's, it's got to be some sort of energy, frequency, and vibration that we, people like me, connect to. And going back to being deaf, I was deaf, I mean, as a little girl. I have 33% of my hearing in this ear. And, and this ear, like I said, is just decoration. And people thought that I was, well, not, they thought I was really disabled. Hi. Keep talking. <laughs> they thought I was disabled as a child until the, they actually realized that I just, I couldn't hear. So I was actually taught how to speak when I, when I, I was taught how we were not allowed to use sign language, so I don't know sign language. But I was learned, I was, I learned how to speak with, um, and a British, uh, she was a, a British speech therapist and she was also a midget and it was beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, that is why I can speak the way that I do and I try to find the words, but every once in a while, you'll see me kind of like drifting off. I'm like, what? Why, why weren't you allowed to use sign language? Well, you know, it was, it was I'm 54 years old, so it was, it was, what, 1970. And my parents, well, not so much my father, but my mother. I was adopted, by the way, mm -hmm. and I found out who my biological family is. But, um, <sighs> yeah. Um, was I, that a religious thing, or I'm trying to figure well, out? No, no, it was, it was pride. It was, it oh, was, it we had don't want to have. Yeah, we don't want to have yeah, a disabled show child. People. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, wow. you know, it's, it was a very kind of, uh, just, it was not okay to be disabled in any way, shape, or form. And so they, mm -hmm. I went to actually to Montessori school to learn how to speak. That's why I can, I can actually really mimic a British accent really well. Can you? <laughs> the right. rain in Spain fools me in the plane. <laughs> now, w wait a second. Now, last time, well, I don't know if you want to get into this here, but I, we mentioned it last time you and I spoke. 
about how you disappeared for a little while too in the foster care system. And yeah. if anybody doesn't know the story about kids that go missing, especially inside the system, and then they kind of are reintroduced into society, um, have you uncovered anything new about where you may have disappeared to and what kind of foster care mm -hmm. system you were? No. Well, here's the very interesting thing. I'm actually in therapy right now. Thank you. Yay. Round of applause. <laughs> yes, well done. Uh, to try and get in touch with some of my missing memories. I literally, there are no pictures of me that exist between the age of six to 12. Like, I, I just disappeared. I really did, and I have some very, I have little bits and pieces of memory here and there, but I really believe, with all my heart and soul, that I was part of a government program. I have a lot of memories that don't make any sense, and in fact, one of those, my husband, who was at an English boarding school for, what, three years? Four years? Hey, Peter. Hey, Peter. Yeah, Peter. I told him about the boarding school that I went to when I was nine in Michigan. And I explained it to him, and, and I said, yeah, it was the greatest experience of my life, and I have like, these like, really layered memories that don't make any sense. And um, Well, they don't make any sense now. I thought they made sense. <laughs> well, what kind of weird memories? Well, uh, well... Visuals, like yeah, you have visuals, flashes? Yes, and, and they're very they're bucolic. They're almost too perfect. I have this memory of sitting with a bunch of my friends in a greenhouse in Windout, Michigan. Uh, it was in the summertime, and we're all sitting there, and we're like crushing cherries with our feet. I mean, and, and, and there's these layered memories, but I also have memories of firearms and uh, being places that just, they don't make any sense at all. It's, it's terrifying. Uh, I have, and, and I'm not going to say them out mm -hmm. loud right now because I don't want to traumatize people, That's but a lot of them have to do with uh, it very, it's a lot of violence, okay. some serious violence, and um, it's, it's not pretty. Okay. It's and you're able to differentiate that from memory? I am now. Yeah. Okay. But what I was bringing up, what I when I was explaining to Peter about my boarding school experiences, he said, he he, you know, he kind of kept it to himself, and he was like, finally, I said, you know, that that's not a boarding school, honey. I don't know where you were, but that's that's not a boarding school, and that was the mm. <clears throat> one of the the building blocks to stepping into what really happened to me. Nobody in my family, my adoptive family, knows where I went. My mother, uh, my adopted mother, her name is Florence Thompson, and, and all of this is, you can find this information, but there are things that don't make any sense. For example, my sixth grade teacher, her name is Mrs. Callahan, she passed away, and we just found out, but I also have a friend who had the same teacher, and she was in a different school in a different place, and we just found her obituary. It was, an, and I remember going to Montrose Elementary School if I was in sixth grade. It didn't happen. And so the school was not formed until 1984. So I have very specific memories and very specific names of places, but they, they, it's, not, it's not possible. Right. So I, I'm not making it up. Right. I mean, I actually have it like, written down. It, yeah. it, it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. And so my private investigator who found out who my biological family is, um, she also pointed out that my records disappeared in 1973. Well, everybody knows that all of the MKUltra records disappeared in when? 1973. All of my birth records, everything. Well, explain what MK Ultra is for people that don't know. Well, MK Ultra is a program that uh, the CIA denied ex it was in existence, but they were using children and people uh, for government, uh, oh, I don't know, experiments. Experiments, basically, uh, with drugs and mind control. Right. It's sort of like that movie, like Men Who Stare at Goats and stuff like that. And I'll have to tell you, I was completely, absolutely just like... Pfft. MK Ultra, please come on, it's conspiracy theories. But when my memories started coming back to me, I was like, oh my God, I'm one of those freaks. <laughs> like, how is this possible? How could I like fit into that niche? But, you know, without going into a lot of like deeply personal things, which you can on my website if you wish to. Cosmic triage.com. <laughs> 
Um, but I've I've been very good at uh, I think interdimensional work. Like I can cross dimensions with people when I sit with them and I work with them, and I think it's a gift. And I don't know if they gave me drugs when I was younger or something. Well, you did you know you were different before these missing memories came along, or were you different after? I've always this? been weirdo. Yeah, but as yeah. far as like them possibly. No, always. I knew that I've always. So been you have memories before this missing time, age six and below. I have so many layered memories, yeah. which is one of the reasons why I really, for quite some time, I thought I was going nuts. I really did. I just didn't make any sense. It was terrifying. Is that common for psychics and mediums to think that they're going crazy? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, th I think that there's a point for the ones that I have associated with that I would say that are... Here's here's the thing. I don't hang out with a lot of psychic people. <laughs> it's like, you know, everybody who thinks they hear a, it, it's. I knew that the, you know, it was my aunt El Edna when the phone rang. I'm, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know. All I oh, know. Come on now, you guys don't hang out online together, like on the same Facebook page. I mean, <laughs> you must have the same chat rooms that you guys all hang out in, right? No. 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 Why is that? Well, I don't know. Is it I don't maybe maybe others do. I have a really good group of friends that are extraordinarily gifted. Um, in fact, a couple of them are here right now. And um, it, we all have our own abilities uh, to move energy, mm -hmm. to create the ability for I mean some can hear. So that's clear audience and some can see and, and that's clear sentience and, mm -hmm. and being able to see the dead and talk to the dead and and even, you know, interdimensional creatures that I believe absolutely exist. You want to know my Bigfoot story? Do you want to hear my Bigfoot story? This is funny. Like, because I don't believe anything until I actually see it, right? It's like, ah. <laughs> I was driving home uh, from California and so I was tired, right? And that's that's important. It was in the middle of the afternoon. It was it was it right at that twilight hour, that golden hour, and I was up on the 101, right, Peter? And and so I was coming up around the the hood. It was uh, n not over the Hood Canal Bridge, but what's that area? Yeah, Brennan. Thank you. Woo, Brennan in the house. <laughs> And so I'm driving along, and it was, it's, I'm not going to give you the back story, but trust me, it's good. <laughs> I'm in this, like, little rental car, and, the, and I, so I look up, and there's this, what I thought was, like, a bear, like a big grizzly bear or something that was, like, cross-legged. It was, like, holding on to the, the branch above me. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're driving on, and you kind of look up, and I'm like, you know. Well, its head turned. Its head turned, and it was, like, complete, it would look like humanoid. And the first thing I'm thinking of is like that is that's that's really weird. That was like a sloth. It's because its fur was like orange. It was like shaggy and orange. So I was like thinking it's a mangy bear. <laughs> that my brain was trying to figure out what this thing was. It was like like literally its ar its legs and arms were crossed on right. the, on the branch over the, the the road. And I mean it had to have been big because you know as as it, it was like crazy it was over the like entire side of the road where my car was going through. And so I'm like looking at it and it, it, when it whipped its head around and it looked at me, I'm thinking sloth, orangutan, what is that? <laughs> so I, I thought to myself, I should probably stop at the ranger station because there's a ranger station down there. And I was thinking I should probably stop and let them know that there is a mangy bear <laughs> hanging over. No. Really, this is what I'm thinking, right? I, I I knew I saw something. I wasn't sure, and I'm thinking, well, you know, there's a lot of weird people out here. Maybe they have like a somebody came up from Costa Rica. Their pet sloth got away. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> nice reach. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> but I just, you know. <laughs> so I, but you know, as I drove by the ranger station, I realized that it was closed, and I'm like, all right, well, I'll, I'll get home. Right. I live in in I live here in in Port Townsend in Cape George. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll make a note of it because this is, this is, it could be dangerous. There's a bear hanging over the road, you know? Right, with hands and a face. And, uh, 
Well, yeah. okay, but I mean, it was it was it was brief, all right. Yeah. It was, but when yeah. his head turned, or her head turned, I don't know, its head turned, and it was completely hairless, and I, I could make out it was very humanoid. It, it truly was, but mm. more like it was a brief encounter. Anyways, though. so yeah. I get home and I, you know, I'm I'm packing, and it's like, hey, Peter, I haven't seen him for a week or so, seven days or something. But mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, by the way, I need to call the ranger station because there's a rabid bear. He's like, what? <laughs> so I, I tell Peter, you know, what I've seen. I'm like, I, and I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's like right before the bridge and da 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 da. And he, and he went, oh, honey, no, that was Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. So that's my Bigfoot story because I didn't believe. I just, I was like, yeah. Okay. What is the principle where you touch stuff and you get a sense of it? What is that called? Being uh, as that's psychometry. Psychometry. Yeah, so I'm very good at that as well. Okay. Yeah, so picking up images. Have you, ever, have you held like a Bigfoot track and got no, a reading? No, I have not. I've never done that. What do should you I do that? Yes, yeah, you should. Should I do yeah. that? That would be Or have cool. you ever held I've, a, I've a hair never done that. or anything like that to see? No, what you, no, I've never done that. What's your impression that? about what they are? I think they're interdimensional creatures that are used as transport devices myself. When I've talked to other people, I think that they, um, they can actually inhabit the consciousness. They, I, I really think, mm-hmm. and I'm, okay, yeah, whatever, I don't care. The thing is, is that I believe that they can, in, they, and a consciousness can inhabit them, mm-hmm. and they are used as transport devices, as organic transport devices from dimension to dimension. Whoa. I mean, I that's I've the more I've thought about it, the more I've talked to other people about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that they are here and they just wait basically to for, you know, the, the kinder, gentler, far friends of ours mm-hmm. to, you know, if they need to get from point A to point B, how are they going to do that safely? No. This place is a, is quarant- well was quarantined and psychically. Mm-hmm. But now yeah. I might have some Bigfoot evidence behind this curtain here. It'd be interesting it's just on the spot. I think to it give would, you yeah. something that was given to us in Cottage Grove. So um, I may grab that at the end of the interview here and have you do a live psychometry reading because okay. I've, I've done it once with another psychic before who was a skeptic. And it I'm really skeptical too. Everybody who steps in front of me, I'm like, sure, you saw a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's talk about ghosts because you worked here for a bit. Yes. You know this castle. You have some stories. Oh my stories. gosh, yes. So tell people a little bit about uh, what you did here and what you saw. I want to start with the first thing of, of the dude who hung himself upstairs. Okay, what up do you know? Up in the um, turret. Like, I think it's like actually right above us. Mm-hmm. Someone's yeah. staying in that room. Who's staying in that room Ooh. in the back? All right, you're All screwed. Right. All right. <laughs> Third floor, super haunted, I got to tell you, man. Ooh, did you see the lights? <laughs> <laughs> are you picking up on anything right now here? Oh, yeah. What are you picking up on? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, nothing. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, it actually, re- I'm, I'm picking up on, on the, the, the spiked interest in, in what people are experiencing. And, mm-hmm. and there's like, f- there's a lot of, of, uh, human emotion that here, one yeah. thing I want to point out, and this is really important. Thanks. Give me, give me just a second here. Sure. Um, <laughs> when you have a like large, I stop you. go ahead, <laughs> go ahead. No, you're good. Mm, yeah. Boom. All right. When you have a large contingent of people together that are of a like mind, all right, there is what uh, creates a vortex here. And not just here, but anywhere you are. And this is how arconic and disar- discarnate energy comes through. Uh, I do have a master's degree in theology. I went to Naropa University, so I got that going on. But so I study energy, frequency, and vibration. And I've, uh, I've noticed that the mob rules. When you get a like, I mean, the, individually, yes, we have our, our individual consciousness, mm-hmm. but I am very, very about the unified field theory. I am good friends with Christina Munns, who wrote, she is a quantum physicist who wrote the unified field theory. She is the author of the unified field theory. And as a result of that, and, and I, yes, we are separate, but we are one. You know, what separates us from this piece of rose quartz? molecules, atoms, electrons, neutrons, and you know, the whole 
yeah, it's it's like how we are arranged is different from this little candle, but you know, it's like how do you remember being a leaf? How do you remember being a tree? How do you remember being a dog or a cat or an otter or a dolphin or a tiger? I was a saber tooth tiger. <laughs> Just kidding. I I don't know. But so what happens is when you get enough people together of a like mind. What happens is this energy forms. It's like a cloud. It's like it's it's psychic precipitation, uh, condensation. All right. It's like I'm not a. The thing is though, is that if you have enough people that are gathered as a result of joy, joyful things will happen. If you have enough people gathered together and they are miserable, think about this. Think about the the Broadway show Les Mis. It was the longest running. Isn't it still running? I don't know. I should have. I, yeah, I think it, it is. It yeah. is miserable from the beginning to the middle to the end, and everybody goes and they watch this and they sit there and they sit in the middle of something called Le Mis. So be miserable, right? Be as miserable as you possibly can. Why? Why would you do that to yourself? Because this is how archons gather. Now, I've done some psychic research on this. I mean deep, deep, deep psychic research on this, and I've looked at them. They are ancient or inorganic material that, that are like etheric. And so it's sort of like saying when you pray, it's like, please, God, help me. And so you, have, you send out a, a, an energy. It's like, you know, here right. I am, right? So this, this, this material gathers... And it doesn't care. It doesn't care if you're good or you're evil or if you're this or that. It's just like, hey, help me. And so it will gather because your intention is there. And if you have enough of that gathering, all right, it is used as a, as a sponge for psychic energy. And so people talk about the Illuminati. They talk about people who or groups of, of, of people who... Well, well, it's sort of like they'll they'll stick a psychic straw in that stuff and pull right. and suck it out and use it. So they are siphoning off of that's what the entertainment industry does. All right. This is what this is one of the reasons why they have a lot of the stuff that that's out there because they will siphon off of that energy. Well now wait a second. They're in some cases, and this is all conjecture to a point, but they actually siphon off tangible stuff, something called loche. Yeah. Do you know what that is? Oh, yeah. Can you explain to people what that is? Well, no, because their heads would explode. No. <laughs> you know, Has anybody like that? heard of I this? I have that. that, that Does that anybody not super. know what Loesch is? Raise your hand if you don't know what it is. Okay. So psychic energy, the adrenochrone is another word for this. This is fear-induced blood that the... Uh, yeah. Is that right? Well, adrenochrome is basically blood that has been infused with fear. So basically, if you're chasing a deer out in the in the forest and you shoot it and it's scared, I mean, th this is just this is just natural. I mean, every, like hunters know this. It's like you want to you want to sneak up on them and and drop them dead. Otherwise, it gets the the the, the, adre the adrenaline coursing through their veins. It, it taints the meat in in the deer, but. If you're a sick psycho and you like to eat babies, but not on Fridays, right? <laughs> because yeah, right. we don't eat meat on Fridays. No, today's Friday too. So. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> what they do is they will. I mean, vampirism, and yeah, they slaughter people. So and, this and is where this came from: the idea yeah. that the vampires are blood suckers. Yeah, it comes from a real place. Have you? Do you know that this is true? Yes, I do. Okay, so there yes, are I people do. out there that are into this. Yes. Whether or not it works or not is the other thing. Oh, it definitely works. Really? Oh yeah, I've yeah. Okay. I've, I've seen it. I'm I myself. I can honestly say that I have never. <laughs> You've never eaten blood. I've never. I've never. <laughs> I didn't know we were going here, not. folks. Sorry. The PG version's actually tomorrow. This is. <laughs> <laughs> not been there, not done that. Didn't. Okay. Didn't, yeah. I mean, I'm insanely curious about some of this stuff here to kind of meet people that know something more about it than myself. It's all real. It's Bohemia all real. Bohemia Grove is obviously a place of insane interest too to me, and these are one of the things that they say. Yeah, goes it's all on. real. Okay. And that's one of the things that. What you about here at the castle? Is there any rituals that have happened here at the castle? Yes. Yes, there have. Yes, is have. that why this may be supercharged? Well, one of the reasons that this place is here anyways, too, is that whether or not, I mean, it's sort of like dowsing. There is this, this is a, actually an entrance 
this, there's portals here, there's two vortices here. This is an inn, and out by the, where the cathedral- Wait, you mean this side of the castle is, is an entrance? In. Yes, this is the inn vortex, and out by where the uh, chapel area was, um, that's now the ballroom, is the out. So it comes in and it, and it goes out. Yeah, okay. there's, a, there's a dual vortex here. So what have you seen come out? And P and Peter it's too, right? You've seen stuff. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. We may come up to the mic here in a second. One of the things, though, that I did want to say with yeah. regard to the guy who hung himself, the monk supposedly who hung himself, uh, it, which the Catholic Church, my cousin who uh, worked for the diocese, I, I called him up on like, hey, just on the download, did this really happen? He, which he would neither confirm nor deny. So that's a yes. <laughs> but. Here's the thing, I did not know, in spite of everything that I've been involved with, I did not know, like how could I not know this? I did not know that when you hung yourself, um, quite often you will evacuate your body and you know things come out of your body, that's kind of gross. Right, yeah. yeah. So, what so anyways, when my daughter that? was working here, yeah. I asked if I could go upstairs and, and we could we could look around and stuff. And and so I'm going up there with my daughter and Christiania, uh, Christiania, right? Yeah, she was she was the one of the the um, she did a lot of the PR here. OK, a couple of years ago uh, when the Massey family still owned this. And so I'm upstairs and I'm like walking around and we go into the turret area and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Because there was all this like, you yuck, <laughs> PG. Okay. Yeah, yeah PG. <laughs> there was yucky stuff on the floor, and I looked, and I was just like, I was like completely grossed out because I thought maybe I, I, I don't even know what I thought. It was just, it was that awful, and I'm like, I'm shrieking, and my daughter and Christiania turn around, they look at me, and I'm like, what the heck is this? That's not exactly what I said. But yeah. What the heck is this? <laughs> right there, you go. And uh, <laughs> then it wasn't there. So I knew that something had happened and I'm looking up and I'm like, okay, this is where the dude supposedly hung himself. Well, somebody hung themselves there. Well, that's a, that's a part of the record book, right? I mean, people know that a monk hung himself, right? It's neither been confirmed nor denied. Wait, really? Really, yeah. But on the website, they show a noose. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you read it on the internet, it must right, be true, right? right? Okay. Yeah. Has anybody Only on my website. Has anybody seen the monk or the priest around here? Has anybody laid eyes on him maybe in the back? Yeah, one person? Okay. I maybe want to have you come talk about this too. Yeah. So you what should. was your capacity here, Sarah? I mean, you worked I worked the front, front desk and I worked the nights. I was on the night shift. Okay. Yes. And you took us down to the, the dungeon. dungeon, right? Yes. There's an area of the laundry mat it's called the dungeon, but it was also a speakeasy. Yeah, and that was one of the things that um I because when you know people in Port Townsend and it's it's like off the record, folks. But yeah, this used to be a speakeasy during prohibition because it was actually closed down. This castle here, or the, the home itself, was closed down for quite a period of time. And But yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on in the basement. And also, I have a good friend who was born here. Born here? Born here, yeah. Wow. This was actually a hospital for unwed mothers and mothers who, you know, women who were not married mm -hmm. and, uh, or maybe poor or what have you. But yeah, they, the, the, because the hospital wouldn't take them. The nuns took them here, and it, this was uh, uh, kind of like an orphanage, too. Really? Mm-hmm, yep. So wait, it was a monastery, a private home, an orphanage, now it's a hotel? Yeah, what? and it was also a nunnery. The nuns had it before the Jesuits did. Okay. Wait. And it's, yeah. Yeah, th yeah. Yeah, that was right. Okay, so describe to people what you've seen, what Peter's seen. So, well, my husband, who's never seen a ghost until he was here, <laughs> uh, he would come and he would bring me dinner at night. And uh, one of the evenings he was sitting down waiting for me to show up uh, in the cafe area uh, where the breakfast nook is. It's underneath the, um, the ballroom area next to the library and it's you go down. And so he was sitting there and w I saw Babushka Lady often. I called her Babushka Lady because she always had like a, a scarf around her head and she was always wore a shawl and she was elderly, is elderly, and she would shuffle around. I'd see her come out of the, 
the elevator and, and what have you. But um, anyways, Peter saw her. And I thought that was kind of cool because, you know, he didn't he didn't really actually <laughs> know what he was seeing until yeah, she just disappeared into the closet that's down there. He, the door actually opened. And, and we're talking like a really small little broom closet. Yeah. Like, like a grand <laughs> yeah, it just like didn't this. make any sense to him. And so when I came back, I was actually checking somebody in because it was, it was you know, customer service. Customers got to take care of them. Right. It's like, no, I'm sorry. I'm eating my dinner. Can you wait? <laughs> so was there a policy not to talk about it here? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, they, they really just didn't want us to uh, indulge people too much. Okay. Yeah. And so how hard was that for you? You like to talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was relieved that, you know, people would come in and they would start asking because I mean, a, indulging people, they they're interested, they're fascinated. Right. Because you can feel it. How how many can be, can feel it? When you walk into Man Race, just but just show us a, a hand. When you walk in here, can you feel something just I a little feel left it. of center? I, I mean, I want to. Come I on, raise your hands arms. Yeah. Arms okay. and hands. All right. Spirit fingers. And there's here some people here with ghost hunting uh, kits with them as well, too. So if you're interested in this, we can have a little after party. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Yeah. But I mean, I can't. I There were so many times here that some of the just really. Oh, and yeah, the time traveler. OK. Yeah, the time traveler. Not you, Darren. Let's what talk what about time is it? Here we got to go. We got to go. No, oh. we're good. <laughs> no time. No, you're good. We can go back in time. You saw something, and this may get into what was on the roof, because there's maybe a mystery there as far as this antenna. But what did you see as far as this guy down in this little babushka lady area? Oh yeah, well it's not the babushka lady area. It's the it's the okay. breakfast nook. The breakfast nook. Yeah, you know, come on. Well, it's not much. Is it really a breakfast nook? It's always dark when I see it. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I haven't been okay. here for a while. I don't know what they do. Okay, we'll find out in the morning. Yeah, there you go. All right. Okay. So, what'd you see down there? Okay, so, um, it was a, uh, it was it was dark and stormy night. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> there was a, a gentleman who'd been staying here for a little while, and so I thought it was this guy. But I also wasn't sure what was going on because we had had a rash of a rash of uh, homeless people coming in during the winter, and it was my first winter stint, so I wasn't entirely sure. This was right before we sold it. We listen to me. Right before the owners of the castle sold it in October of what was it, 2014, Peter? Whenever it was that it was sold, but. So it was, it was, in, in fact, it was a dark and stormy night, and it was really late, and I came out, and I, to this day, I don't even remember what it was that caused me to get up. I think it was because I had a camera, uh, there was a, there was a surveillance camera, and um, if I was just sitting in my room, like, reading or something, I could see up on the television, uh, it, it had, like, a separation of, like, four to eight cameras and I could see, and I could, I think I, I might have seen some movement or something. But I came out and I walked down the hallway. Now the, the overnight room for the, um, the front desk people was right behind the front desk. So, so as I came down the hallway, I saw uh, <laughs> this man who was sitting right at the front table right there and he had, the thing was is that his briefcase, a laptop, was like one of those really old ones. They were really, it was really thick, and, and he was just sitting there, and I could see this like blue glow on his face. And, but the thing that got me, and, and here's what I, I remember the most, is that he was wearing a members only jacket, <laughs> okay? I mean, you know, this is like 2014, He's it's like 1980s, right? <laughs> But he had a members only jacket on and I remember that because my ex-husband used to always, he loved his and I thought it was, I hated it. So <laughs> that's why I remember that the most. And as I approached him, I, I you know, it, because I'm thinking, okay, he's wearing an old jacket, he's got an old laptop, this guy's probably homeless, I don't know. Right, <laughs> sure. Know, I'm approaching him very, very cautiously, and I said, you know, can I, can I get you a cup of tea or something? I don't know why I said cup of tea either. I'm sorry, but you like a cup of tea. <laughs> so British of you. I don't yeah. know. I was trying to be hospitable. <laughs> and 
he, he, his head whipped around and he looks at me and his eyes get like really huge and he's like, but he, and he, okay, here's the weird thing. I've just started watching Fringe with, you know, in the evenings, like I'm just like, get, I'm like watching the whole series now and I'm seeing some stuff that's going on there and I'm like, okay, no wonder people think I'm just making this shit up. Right, right. <laughs> But he did that thing where he, he moved very, very quickly. Like he was just like wop, 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 wop. Like, like you see, like a, the only movie that I remember seeing that in was Jacob's Ladder. Like the shaky man. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. he just started like moving. Vibrating? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like super fast. And I mean, it was, I was like. <laughs> right. Like the blades in a fan where you yes. see something behind it. Yeah. And, and, and there was, and, and he, he shut the lid on his on his uh, not weird I don't know what the hell it was and he disappeared he was just gone I freaked the f out oh my god that was one moment like I'm <laughs> Peter do you remember how awful I was <laughs> I think I, I I called him and I was just like you have to get here now. I, I, it was just, it was, it was, it was too much for you. It, even, I, <laughs> right. And I've seen yeah. some really, I bet that was, it was so unexpected. There was no glowing blue, I mean, because I've, I've had that, but right. I mean, this was just the weirdest effing thing. <laughs> and he was just gone, just gone. And you still worked here after that. You oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you it know. wasn't enough to scare you off. No. Has there been anything that's enough to scare you yes. off? Yes. What, what there has been. Yes, okay. and that was very recent and that's why I don't I don't trip the light fantastic anymore. I don't do. I used to do a channeling period 5 days a month for the last 5 years. I I just I would set aside time to do the, uh, this channeling thing where I would just download a lot of information and, you know, right. be crazy and it was fun and no. Not no, anymore. Not anymore. No. Okay, I, but yeah. nothing here happened that was too much for you. It was. Here's the thing, though. It's like because you can't, you can't wrap your head around it. It's not this tangible thing. It's not like I can reach out and touch a rose quartz crystal skull. I mean, and it, and and you're still here, and you're still breathing, and and you're okay, and you're smarter for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a demon slayer. I that's what I do, man. I go into places and I will. <laughs> I I'll do it. But yeah, mm. I've had some there were two very very terrifying experiences here. And yeah. the the disappearing man was one and the guy up on the third floor was the other. Yeah, I just so I was uh, getting ready to bring in it was very late at night and the mill workers were coming in because we used to host mill workers and it was raining and I was I was I figured I'd turn the lights on for these guys before they came and it wasn't that late. It was like seven o'clock or something. Right. But uh, so I was I was just getting around turning on the lights for them so they didn't have to come in to because, you know, I was a really good hostess. <laughs> the best. And uh, this guy shows up and he's standing in the, in the hallway in the open door and I could hear the water dripping off of his, his, his coat. I mean, me hearing water dripping off of his coat. Like it's, how's, no. But I did. Right. And it was after the fact that I realized I wasn't hearing it. I was sensing it. Sensing it, mm -hmm. and, it and, and experiencing it. But... I turned my head and there's this big giant guy. He's got this like black hat on, like a not a fedora, but like an Australian. Kind of like um it was probably Ron. Ron, was it you? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably you, Ron, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, so this guy's standing there and and, and 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 you could hear the water. I you could hear I could hear it dripping off of his clothing and he was just standing there and that was oh, oh, oh. it was just ugh. Creepy. Well, he had a bad vibe about him. Oh, like yeah. No, I, I invited him to leave. Yeah, I, I just I sh shouted Now, at was him. that an energy taken on that form, or do you think that was a guy that just had bad vibes? No, I think it's it's something that lives here. I think it's here. I think it's it's attached to this place. I really do. There's and a lot of weird stuff that goes on here, and not of all of it's good. However, if you don't, you know, let it get to you, then, mm -hmm. I mean... 
countless nights. I mean, nine times out of ten, nothing's going to happen. Right. And this guy's not going to hurt you. Right. But he's there. And I had to invite him to leave when I realized he wasn't an actual living, breathing human being and something really nefarious. Mm. And that was probably one of the first times I'd actually had to, you know. Kick some ass? Yeah. Okay, there you go. I said it for you. Yeah, thank you. Tell us about this lady. So, uh, how many poor towns and residents do we have we're here? Pointing for, for the radio audience, we're pointing to a rose quartz skull. She's 13 pounds. She's life size. It looks kind of like bit. the crystal skulls that they found all over the world. Yeah. It's, it's and she's actually sat with a couple of them, too. Including Max. Max. Yes. Which is one of the most and famous. And Sha Ra. Shanu Ra. Okay. Yeah, Shanu Ra. And um, yeah, so she actually came from Lila Drake. Tell people about what people don't know about the crystal skulls. I don't know everything about them. Well, okay. what, what do we know about I can about tell you about the, the crystal skulls. Yeah. It's a hoax. The guy from uh, Shasta, he owned a crystal, crystal shop out there. And he said, yeah, a bunch of fr my friends and I got together. And it was back in the 70s. And they were trying to figure out what they could do to drum up interest in crystal skulls. Right? Wait a second. You're saying that the whole crystal skull mystery that Dan Aykroyd is invested <laughs> in right Aykroyd. now? I mean, <laughs> wait a second. This is supposed to be a big mystery. You're going to blow everybody's mind right now? With well, this? I mean, it's okay. true. I mean, the thing is, is that they there are more than 13. Okay. It's like, which one of the original crystal skulls would you like? <laughs> I mean, that's what he said to us when we went there. Peter, back me up on this, babe. I mean, it, this is... I, it's, it's Okay. Yeah. And so the, the bottom line is that these, these guys started this hoax as a result of, well, you know, it's like sometimes you get information and what have you, but they were trying to drum up interest in their own crystal business. And so they, they, they actually came up with this idea to, to start the whole crystal skull thing. However, yeah. crystal skulls have been in existence for thousands of years. And there are some that are starting to show up that are incredibly powerful because, as we know, radios use what? Crystals to transmit energy. And what do crystals do? They hold silica. Silica ho holds energy, frequency, vibration. So if you carve something in the likeness of something, it's like, thou shalt have no idols, idols, right. false idols, blah, 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 because there's a reason for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are entities that become attached to them. And these, these are helpful entities. These are beautiful entities. And Leah Rose, actually, she, uh, she helps activate the third ray of love. This, there are seven sacred rays, chakras, colors, images um, that come through. But, um, you're yeah. Woo, yeah, you're wooing the hell out of this I'm place. I'm wooing the that, hell out of you. With that talk. I can do it. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, rainbows. Okay, rainbows. Chakras. All right. You know, it's like God said he wasn't going to envelop us in... Did uh, it name itself? Did you name it? Um, no, actually, she just she named herself. It was just, it was one of those times when you're sitting right. where it's somewhere and people said the same thing. It was Leah Rose. So do you use this as you're doing session with somebody? No. 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 She. What would you use her for? I actually haven't used her uh, for much of anything other than to be an excellent companion when I do meditation work because she's just been returned to me after a seven-year hiatus. Oh, why is that? Because somebody had her. Somebody good? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you didn't but have to she, cleanse it or anything like yes, that? Yes, I did. You did. And she's. this is her first time since she's been out on Guy. The first time she was out, I, I took her with me on Guy MTV when I sat with George Norrie and talked about the White Light Express, which is my healing ministry. Okay. So, so Guy TV said, is something mm -hmm. people can download on yeah. Roku. Yeah. You can go to Guy MTV and uh, go to Beyond Belief with George right. Norrie. And uh, it's one of the he was it was the second year that he was on there and he asked me to come and sit with him. He's a really great guy, by the way. He's not a CIA agent. I promise <laughs> you. I so Art Bell. I loved Art Bell, though, too. A total so. CIA. No. So now can you supercharge something like th let's say the one she can supercharge you. Oh, okay. she's already a supercharged, baby. OK. Yeah. She can supercharge you. So when they had these hoax skulls set out in places like Tibet, because and whatnot, some of them are not be. real. 
Well, they could be supercharged too, but right? They are if real because they were carved. What yeah. is real? Like I actually have a, a little plastic skull, and his name is Liam, and he's got just as much Shazam as as some of the other ones too. Is that because what makes it's a, it's the power of positive focused intention? Well, that's what a haunted object is, right? No, a haunted object is haunted. So what's the difference between <laughs> <laughs> supercharging something as a... Maybe like we're having this. a problem with semantics. I can supercharge this for you. Exactly. This is, this is the candle of power. Everyone who gazes <laughs> upon it will be healed. Because that's the power of your mind. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that a lot of people use because they are using you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well... It, it is a matter of semantics here because I think we're kind of saying the same thing. You're saying focusing intention is the same thing, whether it be good or bad, right? Okay. Well, here let let let's uh, let's sort of take a look at what a Bible is. All right. We'll take a, a book or something or anything. All right. And 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 we have it's it's when you say the words I hate you. All right. It's 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 very pointed. It's like a laser. It comes out and it hits you. <laughs> energy frequency vibration when you say i love you mm -hmm. it's it's a bigger wah wah it's bigger woo woo it's it, it, it's softer and it's bigger right and it vibrates at a different frequency i hate you vibrates with laser sharp precision and it can hurt you and it can it like hits you right here i love you that's why a lot of people they they th th it takes a little while for them to to in feel comfortable with i love you Mm -hmm. because it just kind of settles around you and some people are just not comfortable with that but they know what to do with an i hate you it's like i hate you too <laughs> right fire back <laughs> yeah you know it's and so when you su when you talk about supercharging something it's it's if you have a holy man <clears throat> the dalai lama his his holiness uh or you know somebody that you really love it's like you know say, it's like it, somebody i they were selling a piece of something that Lady Gaga had, where it's like, you know, yeah, Elvis once held this. So it's like supercharged because why? Right. Like James Dean's Porsche. Exactly. There you go. That one is haunted, by the way. Yeah. We, we found that out real quick, Aaron and I. Did. I've, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've been to that corner a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But you can supercharge these things here with intent. And you're sa is it easier to supercharge something with hate? Oh, is that yeah. what you're saying? Absolutely. It's yeah. more powerful? Yes. Well, yes, wait a is. second. How does that work? I know, right? You tell me. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty heavy, and you've got to work through that. And that's why curses, that's why when you curse something, when you say something, I hate you, or you say something that's that's negative, it really affects the, the vibration and the frequency of your cellular being. Right. Uh, Ron Moorhead's wife, as a matter of fact, Carrie, uh, is an incredible, uh, uh, she, she used to work, uh, she was a, a body practitioner, and now she works more with energy, but uh, she, she will here? tell you about the crystalline structure called the fascia in your body, and it is affected by sound and frequency and vibration. Water, you know, is, it's, it's like Dr. Emoto's work. It's, it's Dr. No. Emoto? No. Does everybody know, Dr. anybody Oz. know who Dr. Emoto is here? Okay. Okay. Dr. Emoto was a, um, he was a, oh, fooey. I'm going to say he was an, an, an expert, in, but he was a scientist. And what he did is he programmed, he, he actually took molecular, like uh, uh, microscopic pictures of water. Oh, after, gotcha. After right. people like shouted at it or right. said negative things to it and then, or they said loving things to it. Mm -hmm. So it would literally change the molecular structure of water so it's measurable this yes. isn't just hooey this isn't just no it's flute not playing and then that's the other thing i truly believe that what i do with tarot when i sit there with signs symbols and images it's it's really just a science because there's a finite amount of possibilities right when somebody sits in front of me and says okay you know in spite of you know hey am i pregnant i don't know go to right. cbc and get a pregnancy test <laughs> Please, uh -huh. just don't bother me. <laughs> but it, there's a finite amount of, of things that can happen. Right. And so when I sit there, I think it has a lot to do with it, like how the I Ching works. So I think there's a number system behind it, and somehow I can tap into that. But my, you right. know, my mind noodle. is capable of wrapping around that. So. 
Are you, and you have a table back here too. Are you doing readings? Yeah, I'm actually going to do three card spreads. Well, I what call is them that? psychic sips. Okay. Yeah. You're doing tarot or, readings? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, actually, Peter, my husband, does alchemy stones. And I've known Peter since I was eight years old. Okay. It's like, it's a really great story. But um, he used to like do these little, little doodles. Uh, they're like mandalas. And um, after a while, I he actually made me one for our... Um, anniversary because we were kind of broke and he was like oh i'll draw on a rock for you baby <laughs> yes <laughs> so you swinger you oh my, my god goodness. Wow. yeah I'm and like, so somebody else saw that that's a really weird pickup line by the way no we'd been together for a while it wasn't a pickup line okay. it was a you know <laughs> yeah. tow along line baby yeah. <laughs> and uh because a i love line. rocks right i love rocks <laughs> i love them um and so uh, people saw them and they were like, hey, can we have one? And so he would like do that. And it was like mm. to mark somebody's birthday or uh, um, an anniversary or something. And then we had a really big order. Actually, I shouldn't say we. He had a really big order from another friend who wanted him to paint 100 stones for their wedding. <laughs> that was the first time we actually charged people for it. And so, yeah, he's he's been meditating, and a lot of symbols and signs and images have been coming to him. We've had uh, Reiki practitioners ask him to do chakra sets. So it's really been expanding. And, and you now, have these stones all over yeah. your house. Like oh, God, yeah. Well, we have grids. them on the table over there, too. Right. Yeah. Buy so one. Everything, Buy one now. Buy two. Yeah. There's stuff for sale <laughs> there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have some stuff behind the curtain here that I want to bring out, but I think I'll save it for after the intermission. That okay. way I can make sure I have it all set out. But um, I think uh, I think we're going to take By the way, everybody, did you know Tub's birthday is tomorrow? Oh, yay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, all right. Yeah. Are you Thank coming you. to the party tomorrow? <laughs> you going to get dressed up and wish him happy birthday? All right, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. All right, everybody. Thanks, Sarah Nash, for coming here. All right.